Let's open in a word of prayer, and then we'll turn to Ecclesiastes 1 and 2. Lord, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for this summer series. Uh, We thank you for another summer, another season, another turning of the calendar. Uh, It's just as we look at this book, Ecclesiastes, and we're reminded that the seasons come and the seasons go, and yet your faithfulness remains. And so here we are at the beginning of another summer, another time together on Sunday evenings, studying your word as a large group. Lord, I pray that this book, as intense as it is at times, as complicated as it is at times, as potentially discouraging on a surface level, Lord, I pray that it would be a real spiritual benefit to our souls. And we know that it will be because all Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching correction that we may be equipped. So, Lord, help us to be equipped tonight as we look at these chapters and we grapple with the fact that we live in a pain-filled, futility-filled grief-filled world, that there is hope and that there is a purpose. Lord, help us to be solidified and strengthened by that truth. I pray this in your name. Amen. Well, if you haven't already, please turn to Ecclesiastes chapters 1 and 2. And yes, we are going to tackle two chapters tonight. And so, yes, You can already just plan on it. I'm going to talk fast. I know. I know. Every time I have wonderful, sweet people come up to me and say, I appreciate it, but you talk too fast. And I I have to say, a disciple will be like his master. I'm not claiming in any sense to be anywhere on the level of Abner Chow, but my favorite preacher talks really fast. In fact, the highest compliment I was ever given was that I was like a white Abner Chow. So uh, we're going to go through two whole chapters of Ecclesiastes in our first message tonight in our summer Sunday evening series. I, I do love these summer Sunday evening series. I've loved them ever since we moved here. It's one of my favorite highlights of the year. There is something truly awesome about coming together on Sunday evening uh, with a smaller group. Uh, there's a real fellowship. I love when we all linger afterwards and hang out with each other and talk about life and what we're learning in the Word. But I do have to confess, uh, this book series has probably been one of the most difficult to prep for of all the summer series we've done. The book of Ecclesiastes is not easy. It has long been regarded as the most difficult to understand book in the Old Testament. Some have placed Ecclesiastes alongside the book of Revelation as the most difficult to understand book in the entire Bible. I would disagree with that assessment. You know me. I think Revelation is pretty simple and straightforward to understand. But I will concede that Ecclesiastes is a tough walnut to crack. With every new paragraph in Ecclesiastes, I began to feel more and more like Bilbo Baggins in the middle of the book The Hobbit when he's deep underground under the misty mountains, engaged in the battle of wits with Gollum, riddle after riddle after riddle, feeling like my well-being, my very life was on the line. It's been a bit exhausting to work through these two chapters, but in so doing, I've been both discouraged and ultimately encouraged, and I hope you are ultimately encouraged as well. At the outset of our series, In Ecclesiastes, I want to establish a few foundational facts about the background of the book. We do not have time to dive into all the scholarly discussions, nor do I think we would be well served to dive into all the scholarly discussions about the authorship of Ecclesiastes. Needless to say, the authorship and the canonicity of Ecclesiastes has been debated for centuries. Regarding the canonicity, you can rest assured that this book does indeed belong in the 66 books of the Bible, the 39 books of the Old Testament. When Jesus affirmed the law, the writings of the prophets, under that heading of the writings, he included what was traditionally known to be the wisdom literature. The wisdom literature, which includes Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, the book of Job, and Ecclesiastes as well. Ecclesiastes is echoed throughout the New Testament The themes that we see in the book of Ecclesiastes are echoed by the apostles as they explain the gospel message of the Lord Jesus Christ. They refer often back to the principles taught in this very book. 
The authorship of Ecclesiastes has often been challenged, but you can rest assured it is Solomon. It is Solomon. Look at chapter 1, verse 12. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. Look at chapter 1, verse 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. King in Jerusalem. Solomon goes on to say that he exceeded all of those who came before him. That no one came close to his level. There is only one individual who was the son of David, who reigned as king in Jerusalem, and in whose wealth and possessions and pursuit of the things of this life that exceeded all others. That's King Solomon. If Solomon is not the, book, is not the author of the book of Ecclesiastes, then we cannot trust the simple and clear meaning of the book. This book was written by Solomon. He is the author. He writes this book near the end of his life. He writes it as an old man to anyone who will listen. His, he calls himself, in English, it's the preacher, but really, this is a Hebrew term, koholeth. Koholeth has real no direct translation into English. It basically means the one who cries out to the assembled congregation. So you might think that sounds like a preacher to me, but really, this is a, this is a man who is burdened with a message, and he will cry out to anyone who will listen. It's been pointed out by others that Proverbs, especially Proverbs chapters 1 through 9, Solomon wrote to his son. It's specifically to his son. And we are just like flies on the wall, listening to Solomon's pleading with Rehoboam, choose wisdom, choose wisdom, choose wisdom. But now here at the end of his days, as he sees death approaching, Solomon is not just talking to Rehoboam, he's talking to anyone. Particularly, he has in mind young people. As the book goes on, we're going to see this in subsequent weeks, he refers more and more to young people. He says, oh, young man, he encourages us to remember your creator in the days of your youth before you are old. But his message is not restricted singularly to the young. It is to all, anyone who will listen. Let me ask you something. Are you breathing? Ecclesiastes is for you. Are you here right now? Ecclesiastes is for you. Do you have a pulse? Ecclesiastes is for you. Solomon, who has made such a mess of his life, is seeing death on the horizon. And he says, before I go, I have to tell you something. I have to tell you something. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Solomon writes this approximately 935 B.C. In just a few short years, he will pass away, and his foolish son, who had all the benefits in the world at his fingertips, squandered them all, Rehoboam inherits the kingdom, and within a matter of months, because of his pride and his arrogance, splits the kingdom. Rehoboam didn't listen to his father's wisdom. It was too late for Rehoboam. It's not too late for you. What does Solomon want us to know? Well, for tonight, our message, preaching just the text itself, he wants you to be overwhelmed with the fact that everything is meaningless. Everything is meaningless. I'm going to read the first two chapters. Normally, I would ask you to stand, but because it's a little bit longer, you may sit. But please follow along as I read. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises, the sun goes down, and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south, and it goes around to the north, and around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow... There they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it said, see, this is new? 
It has already been in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight. What is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, I've acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is but a striving after wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. I said in my heart, come, now I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad. And of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold of folly until I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted them in, all, in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I also had great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasures of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eyes desired I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. So I turned to consider wisdom and madness and folly, for what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. Then I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, as there is more gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet, I perceived that the same event happens to all of them. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For of the wise as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come all will have been long forgotten. How the wise dies just like the fool. So I hated life because what is done under the sun was grievous to me, for all is vanity and a striving after wind. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise or a fool. Yet he will be master for, of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about and gave up my heart to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. Ecclesiastes 1 through chapter 2 can be bleak and depressing. And in fact, that's our outline 
Ecclesiastes 1 through 2 bleakly presents us with five painful realities of life which should drive you to just give up in despair. Five painful realities of life which should drive you to just give up in despair. Look, I went to a seminary that said preach the text. So I'm preaching the text. Solomon wants you to stew in the misery and futility of this life for a while. There is a message to Ecclesiastes. There is hope. There is purpose. There is redemption. There is a God behind the scenes. But before you can appreciate that, you need to grapple with the muck for a while. Five painful realities of life which should drive you to just give up. The first is this, futility. Futility. Nearly everything in your life is ultimately pointless. Futility. Nearly everything in your life is ultimately pointless. Solomon identifies himself as the preacher, Koholeth, the one who calls out to anyone who will listen, son of David, king over Jerusalem. This can only be Solomon. And then he says in verse 2, one of his two key catchphrases that shows up in the book of Ecclesiastes. This one is mentioned 38 times. Vanity of vanities. Vanity of vanities. Havel Havalim in Hebrew. It's an intensification. It's the same word said twice. Now, if you don't know Hebrew, that's okay. Havel is where we get the word Abel. What do you know about Abel? I heard this from my college pastor. What do you know about Abel? Not much. Why? Because he was only around for a brief time. His name itself means brief. Havel, Havelim, vanity of vanities. Again, my college pastor, Rick Holland, I refer to him a lot. I love his sermon series on Ecclesiastes. It's from the late 90s, so the audio quality is really terrible. But the content is awesome. And one thing that I took away from listening to Rick preach on Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanities, is that this life is like steam off a cup of coffee. You go outside on a winter morning with your cup of coffee, you enjoy the cold, crisp air, and you look down at your cup, and every second that goes by, you see the heat physically escaping from that cup in the steam. That's this life. One of my counseling professors, Dr. Street, said instead of vanity of vanities, he would always say, soap bubbles, soap bubbles. Life is just soap bubbles. They pop and they're gone. Vanity of vanities. 38 times, Holloman says, this life, everything here is vanity of vanities. What specifically is vanity of vanities? Well, he identifies that in verse 3 with his other catchphrase. His one catchphrase is vanity of vanities, havel havelim. His other is under the sun. And this is where, friends, we start to see the key to understanding Ecclesiastes. Solomon talks about life in between Genesis 3 and Revelation 19. Under the sun is Solomon's shorthand for this life after the garden and before Christ returns in triumph. Where we live right now in the pain and the sadness and the grief of everyday life. This is life under the sun. And the further off Solomon's perspective is from seeing God orchestrating all events, the more his focus centers on life under the sun. Think of this as a spectrum. Ecclesiastes is a spectrum. At times, Solomon is so focused on the bitterness and pain and grief of this life, and he only looks at things under the sun. And he's not viewing things with God in the picture. That's what we see here in chapters 1 and 2. The further his perspective is away from a sovereign God orchestrating all events, the more pessimism and bitterness and grief creeps into his assessment of the world around him. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? The implicit statement in there in chapter 3, the implicit answer to that question is nothing. Nothing. One commentator points out that this gain, this term gain, is a term only used in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's the idea of a, a business profit. What gain is there? Solomon says, nothing. You labor and you work and you labor and you work. And by the way, toil does not just mean your salary that you get when you go to the, when you go to the office or when you go to the job site or wherever you go. Your toil is everything you do from the moment your eyes snap open to the time you lay your head on the pillow. It's the net product of your existence. 
That's what Solomon means by toil. It's not just clocking in at the job. It's the net product of your existence. What do you gain by all the toil that you toil under the sun in this life so full of woe and grief? Nothing. Why? Because it's all the same. Over and over and over and over. It's all the same. Over again. Verse 4 of chapter 1. People come and go. Verse 5 of chapter 1, the sun comes and goes. Verse 6 of chapter 1, the wind comes and goes. Verse 7, the waters come and go, and on and on and on and on. Everything is the same, and at the same time, nothing lasts. The only constant is that everything breaks down. We live in a world full of entropy. I don't remember which law of thermodynamics it is. I'm sure somebody will tell me, but entropy. Things fall apart. Things break down. Things crumble. Nobody remembers anything. Nothing is permanent. Nothing lasts. And nothing is new. Nothing is new. Look at verse 9. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Verse 8 reminds us that these repeated cycles throughout life never satisfy us. Just as the sea never overflows, the sea never says to the river, I'm full, I've had enough. It always takes more, and then always loses more, that always takes more, always loses more. There's no ultimate satisfaction under the sun. There's nothing new. There's nothing that can really stimulate you or draw your attention or focus. And, and anything you do in this life, look at verse 11, anything you do in this life will ultimately be forgotten. I want to talk to all the former high school athletes Go back to your high school and ask if they remember the touchdowns you scored. Ask if they remember the baskets you scored. Nobody remembers. Nobody remembers. Maybe there's a plaque somewhere up in a lobby that's gathering dust. Maybe you have a few records put up on a marquee that one day will be broken. But nothing lasts. Nothing is permanent like Bruce Springsteen's song, Glory Days. I want to play that song sometimes at Church League softball. Anyway, <laughs> nothing lasts. The glory days fade. Nothing is permanent. Everything is futile. If you're not cheered up enough, let's move to the second point, misery. Misery. What's the next painful reality? First is futility. Next is misery. The more you learn about life, the more you'll be grieved by what you learn. Solomon says, I, the preacher, been king over Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. There is no one other than the Lord Jesus Christ who knew more and was more wise in both his knowledge about the world and the application of that knowledge, chokmah, that's the Hebrew word for wisdom. You have to know data, and then you have to interpret that data and apply that data to living, living skillfully. No one was more accomplished in those areas than Solomon. There are a lot of people, myself included, who have data but stumble at the application of that data. It is better to be someone who has a little bit of data but knows how to skillfully apply that data to life, that's wisdom, than have a bunch of facts and trivia and not know how to put one foot in front of the other. But Solomon excelled in all of it, all of it. Other than the Lord Jesus Christ, he was the wisest man who ever lived. He knew more information, and he knew how to process that and apply that to his everyday life. And yet, at the end of it all, apart from God, he says, this is meaningless. This is meaningless. Verse 16, I said in my heart, I've acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know wisdom's counterparts, the flip side. I think that's a, best, that's a great way to know something is to know it from the opposite angle. Wisdom, madness, and folly. It means he exhausted the topic. I perceive that this also is but a striving after the wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Why? Why does wisdom increase sorrow? From here, we have to expand our scope from just the immediate text, but also look at Proverbs and really what the rest of the Scripture teaches us. Why does an increase in wisdom increase sorrow? Why does an increase in knowledge increase vexation? Let me posit to you two reasons why an increase in wisdom increases sorrow. One, because of limitations. 
As wise as Solomon was, he was human like you and me. He was not omniscient. He did not know everything. And there's something frustrating when you study a topic, but you come up right up to the edge and you realize there is so much more that is probably out there, but I have no way of getting a hold of it. Limitations. Realizing that there were just some things he could never understand or never figure out. But even more vexing than limitations, why does wisdom and knowledge bring sorrow? Not because of what you don't know, but of what you do find out. The more you grow in knowledge and wisdom in this life under the sun, the more evil you're going to encounter. The more Solomon knew about the world around him, especially the world under the sun, in which things like abuse and murder and injustice and oppression and scarcity and suffering, the more he learned about this, the more it brought grief to his heart. There might be some, from one perspective, there might be some truth to the idea that ignorance is bliss. I don't think we were made to know everything going on in the world all at once. I'm not advocating for being ignorant, but for me personally, I've had to recently delete Twitter. It was just overwhelming. All the bad stuff coming in all the time. This church scandal, this pastor falling in sin, this evil, wicked thing going on in this part of the country or this part of the world, on and on and on and on and on. This source of political injustice or... uh, political corruption that there is really no remedy for apart from the Lord Jesus returning. Just feeling overwhelmed by all the evil in this world. I'm not advocating sticking your head in the sand and turning a blind eye to the evil, but what I'm saying is that we were not made to take in all the evil all the time. And the more you learn about it, especially when you don't factor God into the equation, the more it will vex your heart and bring only grief. With much wisdom is much vexation. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. So not only is there futility, not only is there misery, third, there is vacuity. Vacuity. What does vacuity mean? Well, think vacuum. It means emptiness, hollow. Vacuity. It's hollow. There's nothing to it. Absolutely nothing to it. It's like a chocolate in a box of chocolates that you think is going to be filled with like the best flavor. I don't know. Put you know, fill yours and I don't care. I, I would do dark chocolate with raspberry. That would be amazing. And then you bite into it and it's just like Hershey's and there's nothing to it. And you're like, what is this? Vacuity, your hobbies and entertainments will never truly satisfy you. Chapter 2, verse 1, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. Solomon proceeds to go on throughout this section in chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, and say he held nothing back. Guys, he had all the resources in the world. In Solomon's day, this is not hyperbole. This is truth. In Solomon's day, silver was so plentiful in Israel that you would find it on the street. That's not hyperbole. That's true. So for a brief period of time of around 35 to 40 years, Solomon's Israel was the economic center of the ancient Near East. Ancient Near East. He lived in a time where Assyria had not yet risen and he had been at peace with Egypt. In between that vacuum of massive pagan world empires, Israel thrived. Israel thrived. Solomon's border of Israel extended all the way down into the Red Sea. Ports on the Mediterranean, ports on the Red Sea, things coming and going, overland routes of trade. He had all the resources, all the money, and he used it to get all the pleasure. Everything he wanted. He had gardens, he had zoos, he had animals, he had slaves, he had buildings, he had parks, he had women. He had food, he had music, whatever he wanted. Some of us think about a life like that. Man, if I could only just have this one thing. Man, if I could only have this. If we could go on vacation here, if we could get this new car or whatever, fill in the blank. Solomon never had to fantasize. All he had to say was, hey, I want this, make it happen. He sought after all the pleasure. And at the end of it, what did he say? It's nothing. It's so hollow. It's so empty. 
Verse 10, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. This was the reward for all my toil, all the net product of my life. The net product of my life was the result that I could get whatever I want. Verse 11, then I considered all my hands had done and the toil I expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and striving after the wind. And there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Well, not only is there futility, misery, vacuity, but fourth, mortality. Fourth painful reality. You are going to die. Mortality. The rich and poor are equal in death. It doesn't matter how popular you are or are not. It doesn't matter how famous. It doesn't matter how wealthy. It doesn't matter how old or how young. There is one reality that equalizes us all, and that is the impending reality of death, mortality. Chapter 2, verse 12 through 17. I turn to consider wisdom in Madison folly. We've already talked about that. For what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. And then he does acknowledge in verse 13 and 14 that there is more gain in wisdom and folly as there's more gain in light than darkness. The wise person has eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. It's like this. Solomon says, wisdom is beneficial like a flashlight or in his day, an oil lamp. You're stumbling around in a dark place at night. You have a flashlight. You have an oil lamp. Well, wisdom allows you to not stumble into things and trip over things. But at the end of the day, what does he say? The same thing happens to the wise as to the fool. Verse 16, for of the wise as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come all will have long been forgotten. How the wise dies just like the fool. Solomon grapples with the reality that, yes, for a while in your life, it is more beneficial to be wise than foolish, just like it's better to have a flashlight than not have a flashlight. But at the end, after all, it's all said and done, you are going to die. You're going to die. A like-minded church, you probably know about this already, but a like-minded church that often sends their students to Ignite Conference um, in Wichita is grappling with this reality. Their pastor this past week, a 47-year-old man, not too terribly old at all, he's right in the middle of middle age, suddenly passed away on Wednesday morning. And that church is now grappling with the reality that they've lost their pastor and that he's left behind a widow and three sons. You can be praying for that church and for that family and that, that family in particular. You don't know when you're going to die. Maybe it's many years from now. Maybe it's before the building project's done. Maybe we will wheel you in in a box that's shiny on the outside and padded on the inside and we'll have you down here at the front and Pastor Bart will come up and preach a sermon and your family will come up and say a few words and then they'll close the casket and they'll wheel you back out and then a hearse will take you to a cemetery and six strong guys will pick up that box and take it to the plot and lower it down and dirt will be placed over it and then everybody will come back here and or to another venue and have a lunch together and tears will be shed and fond remembrances will be exchanged and, and then that'll be it. This is the reality that faces you and me barring the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We will all die and you don't know when, which brings us to our fifth and final painful reality, uncertainty. Uncertainty. There is no guarantee no guarantees in this life, but particularly no guarantee that you will enjoy the fruit of your work. None. Because you could die before you enjoy the result. Verse 18, I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will be master for which all I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. Verse 22, what has a man from all the toil and striving of heart which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is a vexation. Even the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. Work is hard. God gave us work before the fall. You know this. If you've been at this church any time, you know that work is not a result of the curse. Work is good. 
Work is what we're supposed to do. It is wrong when a man is lazy and idle. We should work. Solomon will tell us in this book, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. You should work. But one of the net results of the fall is that work is now painful. By the sweat of your brow, with thorns and thistles, you will get your bread. Whatever you do, whether you work with your hands or whether you work uh, in an office or whether you work as a stay-at-home mom, which is probably the hardest job of them all, whatever you do, it's hard and it's painful because of the curse. And you might think, well, there will come a day where I can enjoy, where I can sit back and relax. And, and you know, once, once this phase of life is over, then maybe we can get to the next phase where we can maybe go on a few more trips and we can enjoy some of that retirement money. That's not bad. That's not bad. But there's no guarantees that you're going to get to do it. None. None. So these are the painful realities of life that should drive you to just give up turn to despair, futility, misery, vacuity, mortality, and uncertainty. Let's close in prayer. Just kidding. (laughs) Look at verse 24 of chapter 2. There is nothing better for a person that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give the one who pleases, only give to the one who pleases God. This also is a vanity in striving after the wind. There's more than meets the eye in the book of Ecclesiastes. One of the most encouraging realities about this life is that there is always more going on than what you can see. This world, I I don't want to delve too much into metaphysics and epistemology, but this world that you see with your eyes, this world under the sun, is not the only thing going on. God is always at work. God is always doing something. So when you are worn down and when you are beat down and when you're experiencing how hard life can be and there's pain and there's sorrow and there's grief in your life, the thing that tethers your soul that keeps you going is that God is always doing something and it is good and he never makes a mistake and it's always for his glory and if you belong to him, it is for your good. That's what Ecclesiastes teaches us. That's what the whole Bible teaches us. You're probably thinking of Genesis 50, 20. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. Or Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. Derek Kidner, a commentator, says this. The function of Ecclesiastes is to bring us to the point where we face the appalling inference that nothing has meaning, nothing matters under the sun. It is then that we can hear as the good news which it is that everything matters. So let's return to our outline and do a little editing. Let's do a little editing. Ecclesiastes 1 through 2 presents us with five realities of life which should drive you to run to God for wisdom. Five realities of life which should drive you to run to God for wisdom. What was our first point? Futility. Nearly everything in your life is ultimately pointless unless you trace the hand of God always at work. Unless you trace the hand of God always at work. I don't want to steal Cash's thunder next week. Next week, Cash Farney gets to preach one of the best chapters in the entire Bible, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. I'm not going to steal your thunder, Cash, but I have to go to chapter 3, verse 1. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. That word season, the Legacy Standard Bible translates as an appointed time. There is a purpose It's not an accident. It's not a mistake. Everything that happens in your life is not meaningless. It's not pointless. God has put it there, the good and the bad. For everything, there is an appointed time. And God is doing something with it. Jump down to Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. There are no mistakes with God. None. I look forward to next week when we'll have that unpacked for us more clearly. But you can rest assured, nearly everything in your life is ultimately pointless unless you trace the hand of God always at work. Second, misery. The more you learn about life, the more you'll be grieved by what you learned until you find contentment and peace in the one who is the source of all wisdom and truth. Until you find contentment and peace in the one who is the source of all wisdom and truth. Again, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, 
verses 9 through 13, is one of the heart passages of the whole book. In verse 11, he has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Ecclesiastes tells us there are a lot of questions in this life. And you will not get every single answer for all your questions. Again, I can't take credit for this. This is what I learned from my pastor in college, Rick Holland. There will be a lot of times in this life where you say, why did this happen this way? Why did my loved one get this illness? Why did I get passed over at work for a guy who sloughs off and it's just because he's friends with the boss, he got the promotion? Why did this painful thing happen within my family? Why, 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 why? What I remember Rick saying is that Ecclesiastes tells us, don't just seek answers, seek God. Don't just seek answers, seek God. There are a lot of answers in this life you will not get. You may get them in heaven. I don't know. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to Yahweh our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may do all the words of this law. One of my favorite writers is C.S. Lewis. One of my favorite books by C.S. Lewis is his last novel that he wrote before he died. It's called Till We Have Faces. It's an incredible book. I've tried to read it off and on um, almost every year for about 20 years, and I feel like I only now understand it. But the book traces uh, a woman named Arul. And Arul is a princess, and she's ugly. She is the ugliest girl in the entire kingdom. And yet she inherits the throne. And all her life, she's denied things that she would want. She doesn't get a husband. She doesn't really have a loving family. She has to give up and sacrifice for her people, for her kingdom. And as she gets older, she gets more bitter. She gets bitter and bitter and bitter. And she starts complaining against God. And she brings her formal complaint against God. And the book is divided into two books. One really long one full of her complaint. And one short one full of her repentance. Lewis writes this in A Rule's Repentance until we have faces, I ended my first book with the words, no answer. I know now, Lord, why you utter no answer. You are yourself the answer. Before your face, questions die away. What other answers would suffice? Only words, words, to be led out into battle against other words. This main character in this book realizes at the end of her life that everything she's been looking for, all of the questions fade away and crumble when coming face to face with the one true God. You know, we have inspired scripture, something that describes this even better than Lewis does. In John 6, 68 through 69, Peter says, after Jesus asks the disciples if they're going to go away just like the crowds did, he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Paul reminds us in Colossians 2, 2 through 3, that Christ is the one in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Friend, before you seek answers, seek God. He will give answers as he sees fit. Our third point that we wrestled with was vacuity. Your hobbies and entertainments will never truly satisfy you. But Ecclesiastes goes on to teach us, if you are seeking from these gifts the joy and rest which only the giver himself can provide. If you are seeking from these gifts the joy and rest which only the giver himself can provide, they will always prove hollow. But if these things that you enjoy in this life, whether it's a favorite sport you like to watch or a hobby that you do or even your own family members that you take joy in, if you seek for them in them ultimate satisfaction, they will one day let you down and you will end your life bitter and cranky and implacable. But if you seek God himself, you will find him and he will enrich all of these good gifts. These were never meant to be the star of the show. The things you enjoyed in this life, your favorite food, your favorite hobbies, your loved ones, they were never meant to be the main course, never meant to be the star of the show. And if you try to make them such, it'll be like having mashed potatoes as your main course. It will not satisfy you. As good as the mashed potatoes are, it will not satisfy you. You want the real thing. You want God himself. Now, God wants you to enjoy these things that he gives you. We're going to see that in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 9. Be glad, young man, during your childhood, and let your heart be merry during the days of young manhood. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sights of your eyes, yet know that God will bring you into judgment for all these things. 
God wants you to enjoy life, but to enjoy it in a way that gives him honor and gives him glory, knowing that you will give an account to him at the end of your days. He wants you to enjoy your marriage. He wants you to enjoy your spouse. He wants you to enjoy your job. He wants you to enjoy your food, but you should never, ever, ever seek satisfaction in any of those things that can come from knowing only God himself. Your heart needs to cry out with the psalmist in Psalm 63, O Lord, or God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you as in a dry, weary land where there is no water. And when you seek God, you will find him. Lewis writes in Mere Christianity, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. These gifts point us to the giver. If that is so, I must take care on the one hand, never to despise or be unthankful for these earthly blessings, and on the other, never to mistake them for the something else, God, of which they are only a kind of copy or echo or mirage. I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I shall not find till after death. I must never let it get snowed under or turned aside. I must make it the main object of life to press on to that country and to help others do the same. That's what we long for, eternity with God. All his gifts, as good as they are, these ancillary things of life are fleeting. Let them crumble. As Luther said in the hymn, let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. We want God. Fourth, mortality. You're going to die one day just like everyone else on the planet, and therefore your impending death should drive you to the wisdom that leads to salvation. And therefore your impending death should drive you to the wisdom that leads to salvation. Ecclesiastes 7 tells us that a good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter. For by sadness of face, the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools in the house of mirth. The reality of death, just as Jesus told those who came to ask him about about the, the Galileans that Pilate had brutally murdered in the temple and had mixed their blood with the sacrifice, Jesus said, repent, lestwise you too should perish. The reality of death should drive you to the gospel. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 that the scriptures that Timothy had learned from a youth were able to make him wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Death is the great wake-up call. You will die. Therefore, run to Christ. Run to the gospel. Run to the one who shed his blood for you. Run to the one who was incarnate. God, very God, became fully man, lived a perfect life on your behalf, fully satisfying the law, and then at the right time yielded up himself as a sacrifice so that you could go free. And God accepted that sacrifice, and that was proven in the victorious resurrection. And if you are united with the Lord Jesus Christ, his resurrection over death secures your someday resurrection over death. It is a guarantee. Let the reality of your impending death make you wise. Go to the house of mourning so that you can be a wise person and run to God for salvation that is found only in the gospel. J.C. Ryle says this, Are you ready for death? It must come someday. It may come this year. You cannot live always. This very year may be your last. You have no freehold in this world. You have not so much as a lease. You are nothing better than a tenant at God's will. Your last sickness may come upon you and give you notice to quit. The doctor may visit you and exhaust his skill over your case. Your friends may sit by your bedside and look graver and graver every day. You may feel your own strength gradually wasting and find something saying within, I shall not come down from this bed but die. You may see the world slipping from beneath your feet and all your schemes and plans suddenly stop short. You may feel yourself drawing near to the coffin and the grave and the worm and an unseen world and eternity and God. Reader, listener, if death should come upon you, are you ready? You're ready if you run to the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord, there is strong refuge. 
Fifth and finally, uncertainty. There is no guarantee that you will enjoy the fruit of all your hard work in this life, but there is always the opportunity to enjoy God's good and gracious blessings He's given to you today. There is always the opportunity to enjoy God's good and gracious blessings He's given to you today. Yes, I don't know if you're going to enjoy your retirement, your 401k, your Roth IRA, or any of those other things that I really don't understand. I have no idea if you're going to enjoy them. But you have today. You have right now. Are you counting your blessings? And are those blessings driving you to give praise and thanks to God? Do the present gifts you have in your life, your current pain and suffering and sorrow notwithstanding, I'm not mitigating that, I'm not minimizing that, those things are real. We all do suffer to various ways and extents at various times, but you also have blessings in your life. You've got breath in your lungs, you have food in your stomach, you have root beer floats waiting for you in the lobby after this. There are current blessings in your life. You have a church full of people who love you. Are you thankful for the things that God has given to you today? Ecclesiastes 3, again, I'm stealing Cash's thunder. Ecclesiastes 3, 12, I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live, also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. Why? This is God's gift to man. God is good and God is kind. Is there suffering in the world? Yes. Is there evil in this world? Yes. Are we all day one going to die by the Lord of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes. But can you be thankful for what God has given to you? The greatest gift of all is the hope that you have offered to you in the gospel. Absolutely. Be thankful for what God's given you today. I'm sure, as Psalm 103 reminds us, that there's more benefits and blessings going on in your life than you could even count. Forget none of his benefits. Ecclesiastes reminds us that everything may seem meaningless, but there's a God who's always behind the scenes, always orchestrating everything, and therefore, everything does have a purpose. He does make all things beautiful in his time. And my prayer for you is as we work our way through this book this summer, that you are encouraged by a good God who is actively at work in the midst of a world full of suffering. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for our time here in the book of Ecclesiastes. We've barely scratched the surface of these two chapters. I pray, Lord, that we would really take it to heart the fact that you are a good and kind God who is working, that it's your good hand who leads and guides us and orchestrates us through both the hills and the valleys of life. Help us to honor you and help us to be truly wise. May your word drive us to the wisdom that leads to salvation. Lord, if there are any here tonight who have not yet fully closed with you, the Lord Jesus, if they've not yet fully come all the way in repentance and faith, that they would do so while there's still time, knowing that one day all of us will face you. Pray this in your name. Amen.